All right, for today, I just want to have a, an introduction about the course. That one there was gonna connect the concept that you also learned back in 3342. Of course, it's been a year, so it may not, be, may not hurt to brush up. And then we also talk about some other look ahead about what you're gonna do for the course briefly. Of course, once we get into the labs, on lab one next week, you'll see exactly what TLA Plus is like. And don't forget, we're gonna take some trial attendance today just to make sure you're okay. If your mobile phone somehow didn't work, doesn't work today, you have to make sure you fix it. So we'll take it official next week. And typically, I will go for maybe a little bit of lecture in the beginning, and then we'll take a little break by taking attendance, and then we'll continue, okay? Alrighty, let's get to it. Today may not be very technical, but the concepts are also critical, right? Let's see how much we can do. All right, introduction. And we're gonna see Mission critical system versus safety critical system. If you look at a, one of the course learning outcomes, the first one, you guys ought to distinguish between these two. They got another one called business critical system. That one there, I wouldn't worry too much. I will mainly try to do these two. And I'll cite some literature for you guys and I'll read, we'll read it together. Just make sure you are completely clear about the context. And we, uh, if you guys remember from last year, we talked about a code of ethics right, for, for professional engineer. Since you guys are graduating, so this might be even more relevant for you. You might just be interested in becoming licensed as a professional engineer once you graduate. So we'll, I'll mention a little bit about it. And also formal method. We also defined that back in 3342. And we'll just uh, brush up the definition. And verification versus validation as well. And this is to justify why we are not trying to maybe verify directly on Java code or C code. Rather, we are building some formal model. In 3342, we try to build abstract state machine in event B. In this class, we try to also build some kind of like a state machine in TLA+. You'll see exactly how that will look like in lab one. But why do we do that? There's a reason for that, for cost effectiveness. We'll get there. And finally, we'll try to link the two courses together very quickly. We are basically doing model-based development in both courses. And then we want to make sure you understand what kind of model we are building, what the differences are. Yes? Uh, this is kind of a question where curiosity. How many software engineers actually get their PhD? Is, is that, is that, is that you know, it's a very good question. I don't have the precise number, but it's, I think it's definitely worth finding out. But I, I can tell you, I'll give you a little bit what, what I understand. So if you work for a certain company, let's say, you know, for engineers, especially professional engineers, let's say you build a bridge. At the end, of it, you got a stamp on the document to say, okay, me, Jackie Wong, I certify the bridge should be safe for use. Yes, exactly, I'll be held responsible. Uh, let's say the bridge crashes five years later, who would they hold, resp hold responsible? Me, I might just go to jail if that crashes, right? On the other hand, even for teaching context, you would be, to be qualified to teach you guys, I also need to be licensed. Yeah, so I think uh, the licensing idea will be very important. So you guys can throw questions to me. If I don't have answers, I'll find them for you. I think this is more beyond the scope for this course, but I think uh, also relevant to you guys. Later on, I can even share how, my, how, my, uh, how I get my license. Okay, it's uh, not too bad. It's a very straightforward process. As long as you can pay the membership fee, you'll be fine. I'll give you guys an idea. I pay about 500 bucks every year just to maintain the membership. It's expensive, I know. And, <laughs> huh? Yes, that's true. But and also, you know what, also one thing is, um, I think it depends on the province. I got my license from Saskatchewan. I guess they might be cheaper. Maybe for Ontario PEO, might be a little bit more expensive. Anyway, so if you guys want to know anything else more about this uh, licensing process, let me know, either online or offline. I'll try to find it out for you. I can share, yes. Uh, I th I, my understanding is uh, either engineer, uh, SE students for sure, also CS student in the software development stream, they can take it. Yes, I think so. Sorry, I take it back. For 30, I, just, I, got, I just get confused. For 3342, for sure, the software development stream students are required to take this one, 3342. But for 4315, only SE students, only. Yeah. But of course, it doesn't hurt to take it. All right, guys, let's now dive into them and then we'll try to get through them, even get through them earlier than we finished earlier today. 
I don't want to get too technical today. We got lots of uh, chances to get technical later. Not today. Okay, a safety critical system. Basically, the idea would be you want to think about if it fails, it's going to cause certain consequences. It's going to be mainly about injury or death to people, right? Very severe. And also, also damage to certain equipment or property or to the environments. That will be the definition. Very dry, but you have to know. And we'll do a little bit of exercise just very soon. Oh, actually right away. Based on this definition here, guys, do you, do you know of any system you believe that's safety critical? I do have some in my mind. Also, your 33, 42 colleagues, they gave some. But let's see if you, what you guys have. Give me a moment. I'll write a page as empty, and then we'll take your input. Patrick first. Autopilot? Absolutely. I agree. That one is obvious because if that fails, you crash, right? Jora. Traffic, uh, traffic, yeah, traffic light system. And I will add something very relevant, you know, train gate. You know, those gates will actually lower or go up. Yes. Hmm? Air bath. Absolutely. You guys are good. Any, yes? Uh, elevator. elevator, for sure. Absolutely. Of course, that one could be a little bit uh, depends because either the elevator for just cargoes or elevator for human, which will take, right? So just remember, if you have to decide which one is safety critical, always think about what's the corresponding consequence if it fails. If it's only about damage to the cargo, it may not be exactly safety critical, but I'll put it here. Elevator, or of course, escalator. Yes. Oh, that one I'm not too sure. Do you guys? Oh. Okay. Okay, impulse detector somehow. And I got something also very similar. Do you guys know the pacemaker? Pacemaker as well, for sure, right? Pacemaker. And for what's worth, I'm gonna show you right away. This is only for you guys' information. Okay, oh, sorry. I'll go there first. You know, in McMaster University, they actually have a so-called pacemaker challenge. I will share this link with you guys, maybe after today's lecture. But I will encourage you guys, again, optional, this one, but if you're interested. I thought you guys are graduating, so maybe you might find some knowledge we teach in this course might be relevant to your future career. So I'll try to mention them uh, uh, whenever that's uh, relevant. Basically, McMath McMaster University presents this challenge over here. They have over here some specification. And there's a PDF over here. It's public domain. It's basically the informal requirements for a pacemaker. So the challenge is for you as a certifying agency, if you want to certify that somebody tells you, I implemented a pacemaker that's fit for use, how do you certify it? That's kind of the challenge. But you can read a little bit more. Uh, in the website. So, do we really expect you guys who actually took 3342 and 4315 to be able to resolve this challenge? No, that would be too high expectation. Even myself, I don't think I'm really capable of really completely solving it. However, at least you will pre appreciate the kind of a degree of challenge for solving it. Right? So that's something for you to think about. All right, we got safety critical here. And I believe there's one, one more thing I can mention. Also, very similar to autopilot and also auto drive, right? That one's for sure. Okay, safety critical system. Just some example, all right? Environmental one. Yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. I think also a nuclear power plant could be one, right? Because if you got any radius, you know, emission that's out, then nuclear power plant. Nuclear 
power plant. Guys, it's interesting. For the nuclear case, you got the nuclear power plant, of course, which contains the reactor. If it explodes, you definitely got danger. There's another component to it called the shutdown system. Okay, I'll mention that here. Also, shutdown system. For us, you know, our, our place of residence, there is a company called OPG. Have you guys heard of it before? Ontario um, Power Generations, yes. And they actually maintain, well, of course they develop, Ontario Power Generations, the Darlington shutdown system. For example, the, uh, the shutdown system at the, the highest level, they, may, they have to monitor exactly what the power plant is reacting. For example, if the temperature goes too high, they have to alarm the system within seconds or milliseconds, right, to be safe. All right, just some examples over here. And then let's move on. Okay, and professional engineers, code of ethics. Okay, if you become a professional engineer, what would be your obligation, right? It's lots of uh, text over here. Let's now read it over, all of them. Let's just uh, choose some highlights. Okay, you have to have pro professional conduct to all the relevant parties. And you have to be fair, you have to be loyal, you have to be dedicated. You also have to be of high ideals. So these are not really something we can teach you. We can only tell you that these are what you will be expected. But what we can teach you in this course is more on the technical end. You need to be knowledgeable about what's the latest technology to really build a system that's fit, uh, that's fit for use. Of course, full method will be one of them. That's promising. And also, you need to be competent. So that's why we have to somehow simulate some development environments by having some lab tests on you. So you can build some toy system you know, to Make sure at least that will work, right? It's kind of a, our simulation. Anyway, so you gotta be knowledgeable, you gotta be competent. And one thing for your information, once you become a professional engineer, of course, in addition to the fee you have to pay every year, you also need to report about continuous developments. You have to demonstrate that you have been kept up to date about learning. You have to uh, make sure you gain certain credits by taking courses, by having some extra practices, and et cetera. That's just for your information. And consequence of uh, misconduct, if you're lucky, you just got your license terminated or suspended. If you're not lucky, you may go to jail, right? Because if the product you actually built is so safety critical that you might cause life to be lost, right? Just to mention. And this is from PEO. So I think all the engineering society in Canada, or even in the United States, they might just be similar. I'm not too sure about Europe. They might have a similar standard too. Okay, or maybe Asia, possibly. But at least it's for Canada. How do you develop safety critical system? Uh, that's something we already mentioned in 3342, but let's now try to review them quickly. The same thing is going to be followed in this course. And so these are just the industrial standards to say if a certifying agency is going to decide whether or not some product should be released for, con uh, for consumers to use. So there are different standards. For example, in the aviation domain, they have this standard here. For the nuclear domain, they have this standard here just for your information. No need to memorize the name. Okay. And I really cannot really make them available to you, even though I do have some copies on my computer because they are proprietary copies. And if you Google for them, you will be charged hundreds of dollars to really get access to it. However, if you're really interested in finding out more about these standards, you can get some secondhand information. Google for the name of the standard, and there are many papers talking about the standard. Some, uh, some research team, they may say, uh, we try to really develop our system by following this particular standard. In their actual paper, they will talk about around the standard. So that's another way to find it, if you're interested. And, but in summary, across the domains, what's relevant to us? We want to make sure the requirements should be precise and complete, right? And the way to really make it precise and complete, pre okay, let's talk about precise and complete, right? 
very quickly. Can you guys tell me what, really, what it really means to be precise? What does it really mean to have precision on your documents? Anyone? What does it really mean not to be precise? Oh, go ahead first. Uh, let's talk about precise first. Yeah. yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. That's true. A uh, complete definitely you have to uh, artic uh, articulate as much as possible. But artic articulate may not be exactly capturing the essence for precise. Good try. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, you are more talking about like an input and output, right? So that's more about how you define the uh, input-output relation. True, that's one kind of a precision, but to people put it more general. If I say something being precise, that means, yeah, let me, let me put in my words. You might have another phrasing. No scope of multiple interpretations. Have you guys taken 4312? I'm sure you have, okay? Requirements course, yes. Software en uh, engineering requirements. Do, do you mind telling me who, 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 you who taught you that course? Uh, Blackness, okay, sure, sure. Yeah, I, I can ask you guys more about it, maybe offline. So, um, for that course, basically, when you see requirements documents, usually it will just be written in the natural language. Doesn't need to be English, as long as it's a language you can work with. So the essence about requirements document is natural language. Because usually you will elicitate the requirements from your customer. So the document itself will have to be informal. The problem of informal, uh, sorry, informal document is it can be somehow subject to multiple re uh, interpretations by different people. I'll t give you one very simple example. Think about the assignment instruction given by your professor. I'm pretty sure they are very often time, even myself. When you look at the assignment there, maybe the, you th uh, what you think is really required for you to be done is different from your classmate. So that means the document itself may not be precise enough because it's the same documents, but there might be multiple interpretation. The same for requirements. If the developers for the same system, they have multiple interpretation of the requirement document, they, they wouldn't build something that's consistent. That's really the issue. So precision is really important. And let me follow up with this. What would be the best language to be precise? Assembly. Huh? Assembly. assembly. You know what, in some way, assembly is very precise in the sense that it tells you exactly what the machine will do, but it's too low level. I like the answer, but not exactly. Too low level. Um, and, like, formal logic. Yeah, formal logic, I'll just say math. Very good. Which you guys may, may or may not like. Which is okay. Understandable. Math. I remember, uh, I can give you some counter arguments to this. I remember I saw this somewhere. There was a Microsoft developer, like a trainee, into the Microsoft company. And then he was given a very substantial legacy project in which, for which they, he has to make, maybe make some very huge modification within days. And then somehow Bill Gates came to the, uh, his office and then he went to him and asked him, do you think this may be a more precise documentation of the uh, project? You know what Bill Gates said to him? Documentation is already there. It's just the code. The code is the documentation, the most precise way. That's his view. However, you may agree, but at least in this course, we don't agree. We don't think code, it is true. It tells you exactly how the uh, system is gonna be executed. But the problem is if you got hundreds of classes that's interacting together, it may be precise, but you just cannot manage it. Manage it. So maybe it's math will be the best one. Hmm? Absolutely, yeah. Well, so I would say code, 
over here, may be precise to some extent, but too low level. Okay. And also there's uh, another word called complete. And as you mentioned before, you said art articulate as much as possible, basically, right? I will try to rephrase a little bit differently, slightly. Complete simply means you cover all the cases, all the scenarios, right? In including boundary cases. No missing cases. I'm pretty sure you guys know very well. When you submit maybe your programming test, somehow the starter test only covers certain scenarios, but there might be many other boundary scenarios which you haven't thought about, right? So may not be complete. So you gotta be precise and complete. That's the principle. Okay, let's move on. And also the implementation should really conform to the requirements. Let me remind you guys a very important diagram, which we definitely talk about, but let's now brush it out up our memory. Let's say this. Let's say I have some implementation here in any language you like, Java, C, Python, whatever. I'll just say implementation. Can be Java, for example. What I want to know is whether or not this particular implementation satisfies certain property. Okay. I'll say property over here. Maybe the Java implementation, like what you guys did in 1021, is more like a controlling some sensor, which is trying to mo uh, monitor the temperature of certain environments. You want to make sure that the uh, temperature is never uh, exceeding some threshold, for example, right? Now say sense, for example, sensor value, value is always strictly less than certain threshold, just for example. Let's say, what we said in 33.42 was, if you try to argue this property directly on Java, it's not feasible. Because Java itself is a programming language. And this one over here is more like a natural language, right? Of course, you can do assertions, but you wouldn't know where to put the assertion sometimes if you've got so many classes. So we said the best way to do it would be, you want to somehow formulate both of them into certain formal language and try to do the proofs at that level. That's basically what we said in 3342, okay? Let me draw that and then I'll tell you why we're using the same approach, uh, how we use the same approach in this course. So we try to formulate both of them. And we try to formulate it into some spec and formulate this maybe into some property or predicates, whatever. And of course, in this course, the predicate is not the only case. We may also want to use temporal logic to formulate the property, okay? And then what we want to know is whether or not it satisfies. And in 33.42, we prove about uh, invariant property, for example, and also we prove about refinements. Right, just to remind you what we did. So this diagram here is really important because, let me recap, at the user level, what you really want to do is check to see whether this property can be exhibited by the implementation. That's what you really want to check. However, you cannot do it directly. What you have to do instead is to formulate them into some certain formal language and then try to do the proofs at that level. In 33.42, of course, we try Roden for theorem proving, or just on the paper for sequence calculus. In 43.15, in this course, we do with TLA+. I'll give you more information about TLA+. It's quite a nice tool. Uh, I'll give you more resources just in just a moment. TLA+, over here, okay? Okay, guys, are we okay? So far, so good, right? Okay, so how do we accomplish these, two, uh, these criteria? That's something we'll, we'll, we're gonna use for methods. We'll get there in a moment. And let's now try to clarify and not uh, the, your course learning outcome number one. 
what's really the difference between safety critical versus mission critical, all right? It's really also imp important to know. And there will be some keyword called criticality level. I'll get there, don't worry. I'll get there to show to you. To really distinguish between them, let's analyze word, uh, word by word. Being critical means if you didn't complete it successfully, it's actually gonna, gonna impact something bigger. That's basically what critical means. It's important. That one's okay. But now let's understand safety versus mission. All right? Guys, intuitively, which one do you think is actually more important? In the sense that if it fails, the consequence is gonna be more severe. Safety. safety, awesome. I agree. That one's very good. But I'm gonna ask you a question very soon. Okay, so for example, let's say uh, a pacemaker should be very critical because if it doesn't work, it's gonna impact the patient for sure. That's just one example. So safety, again, we already mentioned, consistent definition, it has to do with the human lives. And for mission, it's a very general term. Mission simply means it's being assigned with certain priority by somebody else. That, that's it, mission. It could be a mission to the Mars. It could be just a mission to build a financial website, right? So it can be, it really depends on, on what kind of mission you're talking about. Now, based on what we have seen, how can we form formally relate safety critical and mission critical? Let me be precise about my question. Now, pre precision, right? Otherwise, you guys wouldn't know what I'm asking. Let's say this. Let me give you two things over here. Let's say, uh, let me see this. Okay, let me say P1 and P2. System is mission critical. Now let's say we'll talk about the same system, okay? Just any arbitrary system. System S. And the next, uh, next one is system, the same system is safety critical. And we're gonna touch, hopefully we're gonna touch upon that very soon when we review the math. These two are so-called propositions because it can either be true or false, okay? So now here's a question. Is there a way to formally relate these two? Okay, let me give you guys choices to help you a bit, okay? Let's see. Choice number one, uh, over here, P1 is equivalent to P2. Right, you guys re remember equivalent, right? Okay, I see some reaction already, I like it. Number two, remember this. We're gonna review, don't worry. In case you forgot, we're definitely gonna review, you will need that. And P2 implies P1. Apparently, only one of them should be the case, it cannot be multiple. Guys, think about it, okay, and then I uh, will see if there's any volunteer who contributes, but if you choose one, before I talk about that one, I would like to know whether, why the other two are not the case. I want to know that first. How about go with you first? I think it's three. You think it should be three? Mm -hmm. Yes. I like it. So what about two? Why would you think two would not be the case? Being mission critical implies safety critical. You don't think that's true in general? Okay, okay. remember in 3342, how do you actually prove if something is actually false? You give some witness. That would be a counter example. Can you give me a counter example? in the sense that something that will satisfy P1 means that's mission critical, but it's not necessarily safety critical. Do you have any example? Go ahead. Uh, 
Oh no, here we, yeah, I know what you mean, but let's not worry too much about the truth table. So we are, now we are only saying, if I know P1 is already mission critical, is it always the case that it is also safety critical? That's what we're asking. So it is not always the case. So now we want to, what we want to find is a witness to show that it's not always the case. Go ahead. Yes, yeah. Uh huh. You mean the emission of the. Mm hmm. But that one here, okay, I will write this down here like a car gas emission over here. But that one there could be potentially harmful to the environment, right? That one there. Oh, I'll put it here. Okay, any, anything else? Go ahead. It is imperative, but now we are more asking about this. If I say a system is mission critical, can I always conclude it is also safety critical? Okay, I'll keep that thought. Patrick. Or manufacture an iP iPad that's working. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yep, exactly. Because the consequence of the iPad failing is not going to involve human lives. Not really. Well, of course, unless the iPad explodes. Right? Of course. But let's not worry too much about extreme. Okay? And what I'm thinking about, guys, very good. So don't worry too much about uh, the example that is not exactly what you think. I'm, you have to judge, right? So here, I'll give you one. For example, financial software. It might cost a lot of money, but it may not cost lives, right? And also, maybe shopping website. Okay? Those are important missions because you, might, you may be able to make money out of it. That's an important mission, but if it fails, it's not going to involve human lives, all right? All right, guys, we'll review about this implication over here very soon, either later today or on Tuesday for sure. But here, it's really important for you to know, oh, let me just visualize it. That'll be the final step, and then we can go back. Think about sets over here. If this will be the set of all possible mission-critical systems. Over here, and if we believe this is the case, so that means we are going to have, oh, this is not the case, I beg your pardon. This is the case, this is not, right? Let me make it clear, I don't want to confuse you. This one over here, not true in general. That's why we are coming up with counter example. And this one over here, always the case. Always the case. Okay, so if the mission critical system is over here, so that means they would be a s proper subset, not even a subset, because they are not the same. So, Chidaru, I'll take your question. Just one moment. Give me a moment. So this one over here, so that would be safety critical. And whenever you are actually relating two sets like this, you have to know very well about two parts. What would be an example member that's over here, but not here? And also, what would be a member that's over here, but that's also here, right? Let's now just uh, draw the example we had. So what is mission critical, but not necessarily safety critical? Everything that we have mentioned over here, right? So I'll just say shopping, website. And for example, safety critical, let me just put my favorite pacemaker. Okay, like that. Yes, Chitaro, question. Yes, by definition. So that means the consequence of failing a safety critical system can cause this danger, injury, or death to human lives. Not necessarily people dying, but if you cause some potential danger to them, then that'll be safety critical. 
Yes, you can say that. <laughs> yes. Is it so failure of the safety critical system has to immediately result in like a loss of blood or is it like a downstream? It's a very good question. I would say as long as you can argue that if the system fell, it's almost certain some human lives will be compromised at some point later, soon. Then you can say that's safety critical. So for like financial stuff, could you argue that it's also safety? I, I know what you mean, yeah, because if people lose money, they might commit suicide, right? You know, for, for sure. I, I definitely agree. So I would say, if, for now, I'm just talking about financial software just itself over there, just right at that point. But of course, if this will be a very open-ended question sometimes for the cases. So if I ever put this on the exam, right? let's say, maybe you guys uh, want to know the, uh, how you should answer, I would say, first of all, may, uh, Answer which one you think that's the case, and then just justify with reasons. As long as your reasons convince us, you'll be okay. Sometimes it may be yes or no, could be both acceptable, sometimes. Okay. Well, as you guys are graduating, we should know that it's not necessarily just black and white, always, right? Many cases. Okay, so let's now move back. Okay, so that's the one we talked about, and then, the relevant industrial standard for this would be uh, DO-170AC. So that's the uh, aviation standard that we just talked about. So what I would like to do, one more thing, to talk about safety critical versus mission critical. I want to read together with you, there's a reference over there, you can refer to it. That one, that article talk about uh, these two notions. Let's read it together. There will be some important points to draw. Okay, I'll show it to you. Okay, over here, I'll make it bigger, don't worry. And there is also another term called criticality level, which I'll show to you, okay? Now, just focus more on the highlight part. I'll help you together to, to read. They talk about safety over here. Definitely, it has to do with human life, number one, okay? And also, what does it really mean to be critical? That means it must be successfully completed, otherwise it's, it's, it's gonna impact something else. All right, that's about critical, also we mentioned. And here is about the failure to run a safety critical system, in which case, of course, you're gonna cause some danger or threat to human life, okay? And this one here is really important. This is why we are doing this course at 3342. Let's read it together. Safety critical systems demand software that has been developed using a well-defined, mature software development process focused on producing quality software. Meaning that the process by which you use to develop your system must be mature and well-established. Okay? And what we, tr what we really attempt to show you guys in 3342 and 4312, sorry, what I'm saying, 3342 and 4315 is two promising approaches that's well established. So in 3342, if you remember, we said it's fear improving. And 4315, that's uh, model checking. So if your future employer asks you, why should we hire you? Why can you make value to our company? You should really draw this context over here. Because in order to build products that has certain critical, uh, well, I'll talk about criticality later, I need to have well-trained and well-established methods to build it. And that's exactly what I learned in these two courses. Okay, that's why. And let's move on. And uh, this, just clarification quickly. When you, if you ever do some literature survey or review, they will be DO170A, uh, A, B, and also C, okay? They are basically the same standard, just for your information. The B was replaced by C in tw year 2012. It's actually set in the slides. Some very minor point, but you don't need to memorize it. So just remember, this is a very well, uh, commonly used standard for, uh, for, for a certifier to know what to expect on the system. And DO-170AB, Standard is a set of guidance for the production of software for airborne systems over here. At criticality level, that's something I mentioned. And I think these are the terms you should really know, criticality levels, okay? That means it's gonna define how critical it is 
if your system failed. Okay, let's look at exactly what are the levels. They got one, okay, they got one, two, three, four, five. The top one is the most severe. Okay, I'll put it here. Most severe, obviously. And the bottom one is least severe. Okay, I would say any system you actually built for your labs or assignment in the university, they might be level E because they wouldn't cause any harm, which is okay because you're learning, right? But once you get to the more industrial level, you have to be worried, okay? The, let's start with this first one, catastrophic, meaning that the consequence of failing that system will be catastrophic. For example, if the nuclear power plant reactor failed, of course, it's gonna be catastrophic, right? Or if the auto driving system fails, that can also be catastrophic. And the next one will be hazardous and severe. It's also pretty bad, but just maybe slightly better than catastrophic. And there will be major and also minor over here. I mean, the words here are a little bit arbitrary by the standard, but you can get some idea about the level. Okay, meant to be a little bit relative. Okay, and bearing this in mind, let's see. Safety critical software is typically the level A or B. Let's make a note right away. Okay, you can see here, over here, level A and level B. If you believe the system, if the fails, is gonna uh, fall into A or B category, it will be safety critical, all right? And we'll see mission critical very soon in the same way. Okay, let's see here. Uh, okay, the software objectives, like uh, you know, cr criticality level, defined by this particular standard must be reviewed by an independent third party and undergo more rigorous testing. That means if you really want to submit your system for certification, that's kind of the level that your certifier will have to decide whether, whether or not you really satisfy that level. Meaning that if your system is more categorized as this level over here, this process must be much more rigorous if your system is only considered over here, right? You can, you can, you can see it's relative. Okay, almost done. Let's get a little bit further. Uh, they just give you a little bit more example. Flight will be safety critical. Engine controls, maybe for the car, for some uh, vehicles or other things. Okay, what about mission critical? So the mission is just about operation that's being assigned by some higher authority, by definition. And the failure of that is not necessarily life-threatening. It just means it might impact something else because the mission cannot be completed. And mission critical system must also be developed using well-defined mature software development process. That means even though mission critical may be not as critical as safety critical, that doesn't mean you have to use very crappy process to build it, right? Remember this course title is not safety critical system, it's mission critical. So we still have to take it seriously. Okay, finally, mission critical software is typically level C or D. Let's make a note right away. We're getting to the end for this. So C and D over here, so that will be mission critical. And you might have a question here right away, which I think for you. Should you memorize the levels over here for the exam? I think if I ever ask you maybe questions related to this on the exam, I'll give you the level names. You don't need to memorize, however, it's actually good for your knowledge to know them. You know, if you go to some interview, if you want to talk to people about how you understand about mission critical versus safety crit critical system, it's good to know, right? That's what I can tell you. Of course, you can put it on your data sheets, right? If you have space. All right, and more example about mission critical, navigation system. Well, that could be a little bit tricky because if you say GPS is a navigation system, if the GPS actually fails, in some cases, it could be safety critical, right? Because maybe you're just driving the wrong direction, you know, to somewhere that's uh, dangerous. But anyway, so whenever you want to decide either safety critical or mission critical, the context about the consequence is so important. So for our course, 
I will always make it clear. If you don't make it clear, you can make certain assumption and convince us. That's the bottom line. All right, guys, any question? And congratulations, we just satisfy CRO number one to know the distinction. Done, all right? But that one's simple. I think it's good to clarify right in the beginning. Okay, let me just see. Okay. Let's go, of, go over a few more slides, about 10 minutes, and then we'll take a little break, okay? So what about formal method? A formal method is gonna be a mathematically rigorous exactly what you guys did in 33, 42, and we'll do it again in this course, okay? Formal method. And actually, formal method has been used substantially in the industry. There, there will be some paper I can uh, guide you guys a little bit. I'll give you some reference. I'll talk about it in just a moment in the end. And just another standard, again, don't, mem don't memorize the name just for your information. If you ever have to find some, let's say if you want to convince your future employer that you want to apply theorem proving or model checking for your particular verification project, they might ask you, what would be the supportive ground? What would be the, how, why would you, uh, why do you want to do it rather than just very uh, informal testing? In that way, you have to, uh, in that case, you have to crow this standard to, to them. It's a very well-known standard for using formal method, okay? And for methods and mathematical analysis for correctness and robustness, okay? That's uh, something we know already. Yeah, just review the definition. You will just uh, clarify why we want to do this su such a course again. And unambiguously, no uh, multiple interpretation. Right? Once you specify the logic, that you'll be exactly mean what you're supposed to mean. And also precise between uh, engineers and also certification evidence. So let's say once you have done certain proofs or model checking results of your system, it's a very much stronger evidence about your system being correct as opposed to just informal argument. Okay? That's uh, also very straightforward. And we'll definitely talk about safety property again. And if you guys remember, we talked about invariant property before, right? In 3342. Do you guys remember what invariant property is? What does it really mean conceptually, invariant? We're going to use it again in this course. Go ahead. Almost is a predicate, yes. We use predicate to specify invariant property. But when you say it doesn't change, that one is a little bit vague. What do you mean it doesn't change? We never, re we ne we never rewrite it. Yes, that's more like it, yes. So invariant property will be specified using predicates and it should remain true. And if you guys remember, let me just show you one more thing. This will also be needed for this course. When we talk about safety invariant property, okay? Again, quick review. Safety invariant property. How do we check it? Okay, let's say we have some invariant property i, let's say. Okay, let's say just i. And the idea would be when your system first initialized, i should be satisfied, right? That's one proof obligation we did in uh, 3342, okay? And what else? Well, conceptually, you want to make sure Every possible state that can be from there, taking different events, they should also satisfy i. That's what you want to do, right? But let's be a little bit more, even more abstract. What's gonna happen is, if you have certain states over here, let's say s, i, arbitrary state, somewhere in your system. And then you wanna argue that if I try to make a transition, for example, by, do you guys remember ML out? <laughs> Does it ring the bell somehow? Okay, don't worry too much. Don't, don't worry about it. You know, let's not worry about the detail. I just want to give you some example. Just some transition, okay? By making certain transition, we go to S I plus one, okay? Now, what do we do in 3342? I'll remind you quickly. We assume invariant property I satisfies.
in SI. That's a very important assumption. And then we try to figure out the before-after predicate, if you remember that term, right? Before-after predicate for whatever event it is, and then try to do some substitution and want to prove that the invariant property will be satisfied again in the next state. All right, that's good, good enough for now. And then you want to prove that S of I plus one also, oh, sorry, I'll write better. The same invariant property also satisfy in S I plus one. However, this part over here, if you remember, you somehow have to do according to, I'll just write a little bit informally, just to remind you, according to the before after predicates. of the transition, for example, am I out? Okay. All right. So assuming this is the case, you want to prove it. And we also said this process over here really corresponds to some proof technique you do in the math. Do you remember what it is? Induction, exactly. Mathematical induction. Yep, mathematical induction. And I believe this is weak induction because we only assume one before states. So not strong induction, just for your information, okay? All right, so guys, hopefully you're still fine, right? I think, uh, you know, treat this more like uh, somehow to put together the two courses so when you graduate, you will be ready to take some, you know, relevant career if you want to, okay? All right, that's good, and then Okay, let's do two more slides and then we'll take a short break, okay? And for this, uh, I think for these two, we already talked about it in the introduction, of course, again, more than one year ago. Let me just ask you guys this, if you remember. Let's briefly touch upon them and then we will, give me a moment. There we go, okay? Basically, there are two kinds of questions you can ask about your uh, developments. R, oh, let me just take a look quickly. Have we built the product right? And the second one, have we built the right product? Okay, these two questions. First of all, are you guys convinced these two are different questions? Right? Apparently, that one is adverb, adjective, right? They're different, okay? Now, can anyone try to explain? What's really the essence of each two, each one of them? Maybe obvious to you, but if you can want to try. Oh uh, yeah, good, go ahead, go ahead. Requirements. I think, uh, good, 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 they are connected, go ahead. So I think the right product is the elicitation and then mm -hmm. product right is the uh, implementation phase. Uh, okay, you know what, uh, let me take one by one. When you said this one here, the right product, that kind of depends on requirements e elicitation, I agree. Let's talk about this one first. This one is to say, somehow it doesn't matter how efficient or how correct your product might be. If you're building the wrong product, it's useless. For example, you say, I have implemented the best sorting algorithm ever, but that's not what your customer is asking. They're only asking for some searching problem. Right? Just, uh, you're not really satisfying what is, what's being asked for, okay? Make sure, you need to make sure you built what the customers 
want. And the second one there, you said it's more about implementation. I will tend to agree, but we want to say a little bit more. Okay? It's more about, not just about the implementation being right, it's more about the process you have followed. Are they the right process? Did you use proper process like a formal methods or something that's rigorous, systematic to build a product? Okay. Was the right process followed to build? Right, so that's really the essence uh, of these two. Yes, go ahead. Absolutely, that's exactly the point. Yay, that's good. That's what we mentioned before. Okay, let me write it down. Yeah, the first one over here definitely is verification. Oh, and whenever you talk about verification, there is usually some implicit assumption. Okay, I'll write it down. Also important. So things like design decision. Oh, you know what? Let me write in sequence. The requirements already clarify or already specify. Requirements clarify. You know what you want. Number two, design decision. Made. So here, design, de uh, design decision could be what you did in 3311. You may have already decided you're, gonna, you're going to decompose your system into maybe several modules. Maybe one module for the main, and one module maybe for person, one module for company, you know, et cetera, right? Like a design decision architecture. Right? So these two are assumed to be available. And your process is just to build it re with respect to these known facts. Okay, so that's about a verification. And for validation, it's really to make sure these two assumptions are satisfied. You're trying to make them happen. All right, so they're related. Chidalo, very good. So this one here is validation. Which intends to make these two uh, known. Okay. All right, let me just go over one more diagram and then we'll take a break, right? Okay, we should definitely do that. Now this diagram you will see on the slides, you can definitely read some bullet points there. Um, basically, we have some, something that you want to build over here. Uh, let me just see, okay, there we go, sorry. The orientation is a little bit different from the diagram I drew before, but it's really the same diagram. Let's read it this way. Let's say you have some implementation you have built you want to know whether or not it satisfies certain requirements. The way to do it is by formulating each one of them into formal stuff. System model over here and system property. So these are formal, right? And the system model in 33, uh, 3342 is abstract state machine. Abstract state machine. And the system property here will be just some predicates for the invariance over here, okay? And just one more complication over here, just to remind you. In reality, your implementation may not just be self-contained in the sense that you don't really build everything from scratch. So when you're building a large system, realistically, number one rule, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. If there's something that has already been done, you should really try to make use of them. For example, if you want to do, let's say, a topological sort, do you guys know what it is? previous data structure course. You don't necessarily have to implement it yourself. If the library already supports that, you can, you should really use it. But now here comes one problem. Whenever you're using somebody else's work, how do you know itself is really fit for use? So that's why the library component over here also need to be certified, right? So that's what I want to say, okay? So basically two points over here, number one, here, uh, your implementation may depend on other components 
like a library methods number two, those components ought to be certified. Should be certified. Okay, yeah, just conceptual. Just make sure you understand that. All right, so guys, I think uh, the slides over here pretty much talk about them. Please just read them through. And then you can see here, we talk about theorem prover and also model checker, right? That's exactly what we're doing for these two courses. Of course, you haven't seen a model checker just yet. You will see that next week, I promise. All right, so that's, these are the two. Okay, I'm gonna talk about this after the break. Why don't we try taking some attendance, okay? I'll show you the process over here. Uh, typically, what I would do is I need to first of all refresh my location. I'll show you what I mean. I will need to launch the eye clicker from my end, and then, yeah, you guys can just get your mobile device ready. Okay, it takes a little bit of time. Okay, so 43.15, so what I will do is, I need to first of all, go to the course online to change some setting quickly. And then, settings, attendance, and then don't require, require. And otherwise, you would think I'm still in the sound building, right? Somehow funny enough. So that's why I'm gonna refresh it, okay? Okay, done. So now I can start a class, and you guys can just get ready, okay? I'm gonna start a class, and then I'm gonna do a poll. And then, so, doesn't matter. So you guys will see some image over there. You got A, B, C, D, E choice. Choose any one of them. Okay, I got four here. Good. Good. So guys, I just give you the process. So hopefully, for most of the time, it will just work. Okay? In case it doesn't work, you got to raise your hand right away and tell me. And then I'll bring some sign-up sheet over here and let you do it. As soon as I close the poll, no more arguments. You cannot tell me that, oh, I just came. No. Okay. Everybody's good about this uh, eye clicker? Okay. I, I can typically wait for one minute, that's okay. But once we, you have done that for one or two times, it will be very smooth. Jara, it's okay? That's okay, maybe you can store that later. Yeah, it should be very straightforward. So guys, I would suggest, since like a no problem at all, so from next Tuesday onwards, we might just do this to give you guys credits for attendance. So I don't necessarily take attendance every time. I'll do it sporadically, okay? And I do it sometimes, I may not do it sometimes. Sarah. Um, yeah. Is it just going to be for attendance, or are you going to actually like, put some like, questions and stuff too? It's just about attendance, okay. just about attendance. I do have some very dumb question over there, which I used last semester. I'll show you guys after the break, but maybe I can use that. You might enjoy answering that question anyway, okay? Guys, how about this? Uh, let me see the time. It's about 7.33 from the clock. Why don't we take about three minutes break? Stretch your legs and then we'll, we'll make sure you leave in time, but we'll just cover a little bit more. Hi. Give me just 30 seconds. Yeah, please don't don't leave. Yeah, give me 30 seconds. Yeah, I find, I find a dumb question. I'll show you guys. Yeah, once we finish the break. Yeah, go ahead. Question. Yes. Yes, yes. So 
models that are based on like a software that is based on machine learning, like driving cars? How do you formally modify that? It's a very good question. I can tell you that um, there are definitely some substantial research done how to certify machine learning system. I didn't really look into it too much, but my feel is usually we don't really see a machine learning model is 100% correct. My understanding is you can only judge to see on the probability level. You might say you got 90% accuracy about a model because it's to make prediction. So what we learn here may not be directly applicable to machine learning because that's more based on statistics, maybe not. It's a very good question. So there are protocols for that? There might be some, yeah, you can, you know what, feel free to Google. I would suggest you can Google for certifying machine learning based system. They might have something there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe uh, that one there, the best they can say about your machine learning model is, I have maybe 95% confidence that it is correct. You cannot say 100%. Exactly. And then you have to meet a specific threshold to say it's like Yes, exactly, exactly. Good question. Jara. Of course, absolutely. My phone, for some reason, was putting me at the Pioneer Village. Yeah, whatever it works. <laughs> okay. Whatever it works, I'll be happy. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. But it may not have registered for some reason. Okay, yeah, one moment. Okay, so view the course on, oh, sorry, not this one. Get myself confused. I'm gonna start a class again over here. The poll. Yeah, almost there. There we go. Uh -huh. you may, yeah, make sure you're going to enable that. Yeah. All right, guys, we'll resume in one minute. Okay, just get ready. Did it work? Ah, okay, prompts you, that's good. Okay. Uh, good man. Uh, just one, oh, that's you. Okay, one, two, okay, somebody else. Good, it seems to be working, awesome. No problem. All right, guys, get ready, and let's now cover just a little bit more, and then I'll let you go. Okay, let's resume, please. And for your information, if you really like me to put some polling question, this is what I did last turn to see if you might like it. A, B, C, D, E, how about that? Do you like that? That's more explicit, right? Okay, let me put it, okay, for later. At least you got something to answer. All right, but not for now. From Tuesday, we'll do that, okay. All right, so I think uh, we cannot really cover everything, but that's okay. We definitely want to finish in time. It's getting late. Why don't we just finish maybe one or two more slides, and then we'll definitely finish the rest very quickly on Tuesday, then we get to the review. Good news for you guys. Let me give you a little bit look ahead in case you want to do a little bit study over the weekend. I'll leave it the choice to you. If you go to the lecture site, you will see that I already posted a review of math lecture. And I can tell you that that one there is basically just a subset of what you guys learned back in 33, 42. Actually, you don't need to read a chapter anymore. There's no textbook for this course. So I, oh, sorry, wrong place. Let me do it again. Go to 43, 15, and then you can see uh, introduction there. Okay, there we go, review, review on math. Only 13 slides for now. All we're gonna do will be just to review propositional logic and predicate logic. That should be enough for now. I'm not too sure if we will really get to sets relation function this time. So I would say let's not worry about them just for now. In case if I decide to cover them maybe in some later lecture or in the lab, we'll review them in time. So you don't need to worry. For now, just predicates. Yes. Uh, 
Oh, yes. So uh, if we, oh yes, good that you mentioned. So uh, I'll try to mention next time. So uh, I mean, uh, uh, maybe later. So here, if you do one A over here, if you make sure you refresh your browser, and I just updated them before I came to the class. So if you download it before today, so please make sure you re-download. It's been updated. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Okay, let's try to cover about five minutes more. And then we'll call it a night. All right, one more slide that's going to motivate us for taking a course like this. Oh, before that, I want to mention one more thing. Maybe that'll be enough for today. And this, again, will be something that's optional for you guys, but I think that could be very beneficial for you beyond this course, okay? So when we talk about certif certifying system, if you look at the course description for this course, it, it definitely talks about certifying system. So there is a very common practice right now. Let's say you don't really want to do just formal methods. You may try to do something called assurance cases. Okay, I wouldn't talk too much about it. it can, it's really worth another course, but I'll give you some flavor. For those of you who might just want to uh, maybe explore deeper about assurance cases, feel free to Google, or maybe at least start from this paper, which I'll make uh, available. Uh, you can find the link over here. You can maybe do a little bit more research for yourself. Optional, it's not required, optional. Okay, let me give you some quick idea. The idea about assurance cases is, when you want to make a claim about, for example, your system is fit for use, you're going to construct like a tree structure, a tree, not a graph. There's no cycle, okay? So it goes like this. You may have some top level claim that you want to claim, or you want to establish, and the claim might depend on subclaims over here. And to really prove the subclaim, you have to submit some, supply some evidence. I'll give you one example right away. Okay, let's say, again, bridge controller, okay, if you don't mind. So let's say the claim would be the bridge controller is fit for use. One claim we can make over here is, it is, let me write this turn down and see if you guys recall what we learned. Correct by construction. Does any one of you remember what correct by construction really means? That was not an exam question. I wanted to put it, but I didn't really end up putting it. Anyway, Jora, what is that, if you remember? Absolutely, that's spot on, exactly right. So correct by construction, which we'll review very briefly again next Tuesday about what Jara, Jara said was exactly accurate. So correct by construction is basically start with some very simple model and do gradual refinements into the final one that's reasonably close to code, all right? That's something we'll review, don't worry, quickly. And when we claim that it is correct by construction, what could be the possible evidence? You can maybe submit your rodent project showing all the proof obligation or your secret proof, right? So you can think about this particular branch over here is by using some formal method, this branch. And one advantage of using assurance cases is you can somehow combine formal arguments with informal arguments. For example, our formal model here doesn't really cover the case, but what if there's an earthquake? Is it a controller? Is the controller resilient enough to maybe earthquake? So that would be another kind of analysis we have to do, right? So that's why you got another maybe subclaim, which you can do, but that one there may not be able to be proved just by having rodent proofs or sequence proofs, right? Something different. I'll write it down here and I'll make a quick remark. Subclaim number two over here could be uh, resistant to earthquake. And now, 
if you submit, let's say, this assurance case to some certifier, what they have to look at it would be, they look at this will be your top claim. And they, they, they realize you actually try some formal verification on this branch. Also, you try to do other analysis, maybe hazard analysis, based on whether there's going to be earthquake and et cetera. So they will try to decide whether your argument will be complete enough. So only this branch over here is formal. That's the nature of assurance cases. So formal method is definitely good, but in reality, you may have to combine that with something else. That's my point. Yes, Patrick. It's a very good question. How rigorous or how precise should the evidence be? The assurance case approach itself does not specify. It's completely up to you as a developer. When you want to submit your uh, claim for certification, it's completely up to you. Maybe you haven't done any certification. Maybe everything is based on peer review or human review. That's possible. So it's really up to the certifier whether or not they're convinced. Okay. Very good. All right, guys, final remark. For this one here, not, cover, uh, not required by the course, but for those of you who may want to explore, Google for assurance cases. You might find some very interesting uh, things for you to learn outside the course, okay? Only for your information. Alrighty, so I think uh, now will be a good time to pause, and then we're gonna resume for next time. And for those of you who may want to do a little bit of study, feel free to go over the slides on uh, the uh, math review, just about the predicates. All right. Otherwise, I'll see you next Tuesday. Take care. <laughs>